Hello, my friends, and welcome back to today's episode of Everyday Truths. If you are on the audio version of our podcast, then you know, you don't know that I am sitting in a car on a rainy day in North Carolina, and I just picked up my Dunkin' Donuts coffee. So um, I'll show you that. There it is, large Dunkin' Donuts coffee. So life is good here in Brevard, North Carolina, but I wanted to be able to talk to you and keep our daily podcast going. And so I am pre-recording this, so you'll hear it sometime next week, but just wanted you to know that we're uh, getting the job done here in North Carolina. Uh, Thanks for joining us. We're in Romans 9, and we're in a section here in verse number, uh, where did we leave off yesterday? We talked about the potter and the clay last episode, and we're in verse number 22, Let me read the verses that we will cover for today and then uh, get us up to speed. So Romans chapter 9, verse number 22, Paul asks a hypothetical question. Remember, he's dealing with this snarky, arrogant objector. You know, why does God find fault? And basically, Paul rebukes him and says, "Wait, wait a minute, who are you to reply against God? Very, very similar to the way God himself responded to Job. When Job had all of those questions about, God, what are you doing? And basically, uh, God came back to Job with the, where were you? (laughs) Where were you when I made the world, Job? There are certain questions and certain attitudes that we have with questions that we simply should come to God much more humbly. And uh, Paul has dealt with these kinds of questions all throughout his ministry, especially to his fellow Jews. But here in Romans 9 and verse 22, he asks a hypothetical question. And here it is. What if God, willing to show his wrath and make his power known? So what do we know about the Lord? Still talking about Pharaoh, by the way, and, and dealing with these vessels of wrath. Uh, the hardened condition of Pharaoh. So was God willing to deal with Pharaoh? Of course he was. Was God able to deal with Pharaoh? Of course he was. And was Pharaoh deserving of God's judgment? The very first time that Pharaoh resisted God, of course he was. So it's not a matter of God overlooking sin or having a soft view on rebellion. But God has purposes in allowing people that are rebellious and people that are sinful to continue in that rebellion and sin. And watch what it says, verse number 22. So what if God, willing to show his wrath and make his power known, so God is willing to do that at any given moment, but instead endures. See that, verse 22? What if he, willing to show his wrath and make his power known, endured with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. So instead of dealing with them expeditiously, at least from our perspective, but instead putting up with them, allowing them to persist in and even exacerbating through hardening their rebellious condition. Well, what if God wanted to do, to do that? And then verse number 23 And, so the the hypothetical thought continues, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. So what is the Apostle Paul driving at here? He's driving at this theme that he introduced several verses ago, and that is that God's plan to push forward his plan for the salvation of the world. Remember the promise to Abraham, the election of Abraham and his children, not all of them, but some of them. God's not reneging on his promise. He's pushing his promise forward. What have we learned? That the advancement of God's purpose is not a matter of the lineage. We can't claim, well, God uses Me, because I'm a child of Abraham. Well, not all the children of Abraham were part of God's plan. Not all Israel is Israel. He's made that point. And then God does not advance his plan according to the good intentions and the good works of his people. Because as we have seen in the case of Exodus 33, God's people have not always had the best intentions. 
Sometimes their intention was to be idolatrous. God's people have not always expressed good behaviors and good works. As the law indicated, the law was added to show them just how sinful they were. So if God is going to advance his plan, how is he going to advance his plan? Through mercy, through mercy. Mercy to his own people when he could have wiped them out, but Moses humbly and faithfully interceded. And mercy in putting up with people like Pharaoh when he could have squashed him like a little bug, but allowed him to persist in his rebelliousness so that in that long suffering that God was demonstrating, he was going to manifest his glory in greater ways to his own people. And that's exactly what happened, as we pointed out last episode. And people actually heard about the way that God demonstrated his power in and through those plagues, how he demonstrated wonderfully his power and his glory in saving them through the parting of the Red Sea. And all of that, Rahab and others were hearing about that. God's own people were learning from that. And so God had a purpose in all of it. Now, what's interesting in verses 22 and 23 of our text today is that this is a what if statement that never has the then part of it. So if God, then, but Paul never gets to the then. Grammatically, This is a cliffhanger statement that Paul makes, like an elliptical statement. Like we make statements even today, like, boy, if I had only done, and then we don't finish the sentence because the if part is enough. It expresses the heart. And the heart that the apostle Paul is expressing here is, wow, God is not being this cosmic bully But God is demonstrating his mercy, not just to his people, but even in putting up with the rebellion of people like Pharaoh, who worshiped himself, who said to Moses, who is this God that I don't even know? I mean, God could very easily have squashed him in the moment. So the fact that God is expressing patience and kindness, the goodness of God, Paul's already talked about this back in chapter two, in this very context of human sinfulness, that the goodness of God, the long suffering, the forbearance of God can lead us to repentance. And the point I made yesterday was this, hardened hardened does not mean hopeless. You say, well, Kurt, how can you even make that statement? I mean, if God hardens somebody, doesn't that mean that he has predetermined that they cannot believe, that they cannot ever get right, that he has just decided arbitrarily that they are better served as a object of his wrath and destruction? No, God can use our bad choices, obviously, for his glory. And he can use the bad choices of rebellious people even to teach the people that receive mercy great truths. But hardenedness, if that's a word, does not mean hopelessness. How do I know that? Because I know that because the Apostle Paul tells us that. He tells us that all of these illustrations that he's using about Israel's history are to help her understand that you, you unbelieving Israel, you are like Esau, you are like Ishmael, you are like Pharaoh. What a stinging rebuke that must have been. And those that invest faith in God's plan and faith in the culmination of God's plan, uh, the arrival of the seed, the person of Jesus Christ, of the redemption provided through him, they are the ones who are counted children of Abraham. So watch what it says in verse number 24. And here's where he brings his, uh, all of these illustrations to an applicational conclusion. Verse number 24, even us. So Paul says, hey, this is my testimony. Even us, I was one of those hardened Jews. I was so hardened that I spent my life chasing down Christians. I spent my life putting them in jail. I was there and consenting when Stephen died and was executed. That, that was my will. I, I was this hardened Jew 
that didn't believe for a moment that Jesus was anything else but an imposter. I was hardened in that sense. I was rebellious in that sense. I breathed out threatenings and slaughters against God's people. Jesus told me that I was persecuting him there in that conversation in Acts chapter nine. So Paul is seeing his own rescue and the rescue of other Jews and then the inclusion of these Gentiles. Watch what it says, verse 24. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So where is Paul going with all this? He's going to the end of the chapter where he's gonna make the conclusion that God forwarded his plan by mercy, by his promise. God did not rig and on his promise. God faithfully and mercifully moved his plan along because Jesus did come. And even though Jerusalem and the Jews now are hardened and rebellious toward this truth, hardened does not mean hopeless. And if they will put faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if they will believe the message, the, the Bible message that Paul is giving them, then they can be engrafted back in and they too can be Abraham's seed. And we're gonna see that marvelous invitation in Romans chapter number 11. So the story unfolds, but it unfolds gloriously. And God is not arbitrarily selecting some people to go to heaven and some people to go to hell. I'll perish that thought. No, God's plan from the beginning is that through an exclusive minority, he would reveal his inclusive plan for all nations. And here it is in black and white. And Paul has this heart of compassion for his own people. Please see it. I know you're hardened, but hardened does not mean hopeless. Hope that helps today, my friends. Hope you have a great day in the Lord. God bless you.